So I've never seen myself as the most mechanically inclined person. And looking at 3D printing, I really didn't know if it would be something that I could get into or even do well. But I was wrong, and I want to talk to you about what I've learned about 3D printing. So the first machine I got is the Ender 3 V2. This is a fairly inexpensive machine. They run around $250. Pretty inexpensive for a functional 3D printer that can print at the size that it does. So. The first thing you might notice about the Ender 3 is that there are big wheels at the bottom of it, and that's because the bed is not automatically leveled. This is something I have come to not like about this machine, and that is because leveling the bed is one of the more challenging things, even compared to, you know, these machines come in kits and you have to put them together, but leveling the bed can be sort of challenging. What you have to do is you print out a little test print that sort of shows how well it's doing and you take the pieces off of that and see how they look. If they kind of fall apart in your hand, it's, it's too high up. Uh, same, you know, kind of thing can be true for if it's too low. You want it to be like a solid, uh, thick plastic, basically. So what you have to do is kind of continually adjust these wheels and sometimes you'll, you know, use a piece of paper to get it started and then uh, print that thing again, and then adjust it slightly, and then you'll eventually get it on the spot. But you will have to go back and readjust it periodically. I've had times where I can go a month or two without having to touch it, and then other times where it seems like I do one thing and all of a sudden it's off level again. And while that is a little bit frustrating, considering the price of the Ender 3 V2, it's not a big deal. Now, with the Ender 3 V2, I started, of course, like everyone else, just printing little things. So I started with the test print that came with it, but then I would find things on Thingiverse. And so what you do with this is you go on this website called Thingiverse. This is where people post models of things that you can, you know, print. And you download those as STL files. Now what you do is you take that STL file and you put it into what's called a slicer. And the slicer is the program that takes the 3D model and it tells the printer how to print it. It basically converts it to code for the printer to print. So here I'm doing this with this little turtle. And then you go and you take the turtle and you put it into the machine in a USB drive as what's called G code. And the printer will follow that set of instructions to actually print. Now G code is really, really simple code. It's a lot like the uh, dot matrix printers of old where it's just a bunch of different positions and a few other parameters for each line. Of course, that, that code is, you know, thousands upon thousands of lines long, and not only do you not write it, you wouldn't want to. So basically, though, the print will start out by kind of printing a first layer, trying to get everything situated. And what can happen is if you don't have your bed level or something's off, this first layer will not go well. And honestly, the first layer is kind of the most important thing to get right. After you get the first layer right, generally things tend to go okay with some possible exceptions. So the printer will continue to print upwards. The important thing to remember is that it only goes from Z0 to you know, Z max, which means it doesn't swivel, it doesn't move the nozzle at angles, it's only going straight down and moving up slowly as it does layer by layer. This is what we call additive manufacturing. And if you want to sound cooler with your hobby than say I 3D print stuff, say you're into additive manufacturing. It sounds way cooler. So another neat thing about the Ender is it just sounds cool. I just love that aesthetic. I know it makes me a nerd, whatever. It's so cool to just hear that in your house. So what is this material, you might be wondering, that the Ender is printing in? Well, this is a material called PLA. Now, PLA is one of the more renewable-friendly materials in that it can be composted, not the way you think. If you throw it in your garden, you're just going to have a lot of plastic in your garden, basically. But if it is put into some type of chamber that is heated to a certain temperature, it can be effectively composted. That's actually a lot more than you can say for most plastics out there. So PLA has several advantages and very few disadvantages, but they are a little bit striking. 
The biggest disadvantage of it is its heat resistance. PLA prints between uh, 200 and 230 degrees Celsius, and its glass transition temperature is really what you care about because you don't really care about how hot it prints. You care about when is it going to be damaged by heat. And for PLA, this is considerably low. So PLA, once you get over, say, 115, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, something us Americans are more familiar with, it starts to enter the danger zone of being able to not melt, but warp. That it could begin to kind of bend, and this will be a factor of just how hot is it and how much load is it under. So for instance, if you wanted to print something to hold a coffee cup in your car in PLA, that would probably be a bad idea. Because if you close the door in your car in summer and it got hot, the weight of the coffee cup would pretty quickly bend it and the coffee cup would fall and it would get coffee all over your car. So PLA is good for most situations. Anything that's going to be left inside, it's pretty good for that. Anything that needs to be detailed, it's about the best material for that. And uh, as long as it's not going to be exposed to high temperatures like a hot car in summer, and um, it's not going to be under a lot of load, then it's a good material and it can sustain some load. Um, like this thing I have right here is made of PLA and this is a clamp. Now, I could make a stronger clamp out of a different material, but I'll use something like this to hold pieces together that I'm trying to glue and it does just fine. So it can sustain a decent amount of load. It's just not quite as good as some other materials would be. And that's because it, it can be for plastics, you know, as far as plastics are concerned, it can be a little bit on the brittle side. And that will vary depending on the brand of uh, PLA that you get. Something like this, you know, I can, I can screw it together. I can push pretty hard on these threads on this plastic screw. And it's, it's just fine. So PLA, you know, it's good for a lot of things, but there are edge cases that it doesn't really capture well. I do most of my printing in PLA, and uh, my brother actually uh, sells things he 3D prints, and he ships them, uh, you know, printed in PLA, and he doesn't have any problems. It's really only when you're talking about high temperatures that, it, you know, it's a problem. Even outside, uh, PLA can do fine outside, but it will degrade a little bit more than some other plastics because of, you know, UV damage. Um, but honestly, like, if I'm going to print some Halloween decorations, I have no problem doing that in PLA because they're not going to be outside all that long. And the thing is, anything you leave outside in the sun is going to get damaged. So think about, like, old flower pots that you may have seen that have been outside in the sun for a long time. They're going to get uh, a little bit damaged. So that's the first material that most people start with is PLA, and I think it's the most popular today, and that's because it's very easy to print. This is the big advantage of it. It's very easy to have uh, that first layer go down well and stick well. Uh, one problem you can have with some other materials is they will begin to warp as the, you know, as it cools down, it, it tends to want to contract, and that contraction can cause the first layer to peel off the bed. That's something that you know, we don't want to have happen because if it begins to move while the printer is printing it, it has a, a very high potential of knocking it over, moving it a little bit, and everything has to be very precise with these printers. So that's PLA, and that's the Ender 3, and that's what I started with. Now, I went on to a more expensive machine that actually has a smaller uh, build plate known as the Prusa Mini. And this is actually the one my brother originally recommended I get. It was a very good recommendation. I love the Prusa Mini. One of the big things I love about the Prusa Mini is it's quiet. The Ender 3 is not very quiet. So I want to talk about how these machines work. Generally, these are just a board, like a small um, computer motherboard, that's connected to a bunch of stepper motors and a few other things. The stepper motors, one of them moves the bed back and forth, the other one moves the nozzle left and right, and then yet another one moves it up or down. Now, there's yet another stepper motor that actually its job is to work with the filament. So the filament is fed into it and 
basically this motor is responsible for either pushing it in or pulling it back. Now you might wonder why would it ever pull it back? Well, it has to do something called retraction. And retraction is when if, if the printer is going to move but doesn't want to actually put material out, it will pull it back a little bit and then it will push it forward. One cool thing about the Prusa Mini is it auto bed levels, which means it actually probes the bed at several different points and figures out where the discrepancies are and just compensates for it. This makes it much easier to deal with that bed leveling thing because you really just don't have to. So when I got the Prusa Mini, I also got into something else, and this has been the best thing. I'm the kind of person that I'll be working on something and I'll think I just need something that's like, like this and it has a bend in it like that, and I'll like search the house for something that sort of fits the bill. Now that rarely ever ends successfully, but now I have the ability to print things. So maybe I shouldn't just print things that I can find online. Maybe I should try making my own things and seeing if the printer can do that. Well, it turns out it absolutely can. Now, this started with me with these things here. So where I work, uh, we have to wear you know, a badge that would go kind of on the back of it like this. And we have to have something that holds it. Now, you can just get a normal thing that holds a single badge, but because I work around people that are uh, engineering, science-minded, uh, there's a bit of almost a competition to see how much, you know, how many accessories can you hold in this thing. So this one is one that a lot of people go to because it can hold what's called an RSA token and a HID token and a badge. Now, the issue with this is that most people in my department don't have an RSA token. It's not something we use. And this thing here, while it, it, this is printable, the version of it that doesn't have that in it is actually very difficult to print well without a ton of supports, basically. I'm gonna get into supports um, later. So I set out to design something that was more fit for my department. And um, I actually did that. So I can't show my badge in a YouTube video, so I've just replaced it with a uh, Starbucks gift card. And then I have it holding the HID token just as the other one did. But we also have these things where I work. These, uh, we call them DA tokens. And they're these kind of, let's see if I can get the camera to focus, these sort of oddly shaped, you know, USB sticks. And it was, there was nothing out there for these things. But what I did was I took a picture of it and I went to Photoshop, which is something I'm experienced with from this YouTube channel, and I kind of made an outline of it. Then I took it into a Tinkercad, and I made it a three-dimensional thing. I had to mess around with tolerances a little bit, but by the end of it, I had this. I have something, you know, a badge holder that can also hold this token. And this is something that actually someone else requested, but then I was like, geez, that's a really good idea. Maybe I could make my own design. So I did. And then another thing hit me that a badge holder, you know, while PLA is fine for that, it is something that I could see someone leaving in a hot car. I want to make this, you know, details not super important. This is not a, uh, a model uh, of, of something. This is more of a functional device. And so... I did it in a material called PETG. Now, the reason it's in a bag is it's more hygroscopic, and I hope I'm saying that right. What that really means is that it can absorb moisture. Now, the absorption of moisture for the plastic itself is not a bad thing, unless that you, know, you wanna print it, then it's kind of a bad thing because you're gonna get some uh, bad quality out of that. It's going to pop and fizzle as it goes through the hot end. So I keep it in bags because I don't want it to have that happen. There are ways to dry it out if I had to, but uh, it is a bit more hygroscopic than PLA is, where PLA can pretty much be left out um, even in a not great environment, a humid environment, for quite a long time before any problem would occur. Um, I haven't had any issues with this, and I may not have to keep it in bags, but either way, I do. 
So there's other downsides to PETG compared to PLA. One is that it is harder to print, despite what some people may tell you. It's not much harder, but you're going to have to hone your printer a little bit more to be able to do it. Once you do, everything should be fine. It does something that they call boogering that I don't have video of because I'm lucky enough to have gotten past it, at least I think. And what that means is material can kind of build up on the nozzle until it becomes a big uh, piece of material and it burns and then you get kind of a, uh, a burnt char in your print. Now, I don't know if the camera will be able to pick up on this, but that sort of happened with this guy here. And let's see if I can show that to you. Yeah, it doesn't look like the camera really wants to pick it up. It's very faint, basically. You can see that little dot on it. There it is. There it is. So not a big deal, but if it had happened on the front or something, it kind of just wouldn't look good, right? So I got around that, um, you know, a bit of leveling helped with that and just cleaning the nozzle sometimes between prints also did. Uh, other downsides to PETG uh, is that it's more prone to warping than PLA is, which means that as you print, things cool down and basically there will be a contractionary force that, pull, that pulls inward. And it wants to pull that first layer, that really important layer, up. And the problem with that is that now you have the edges higher than the lower portion of the print, and it could mess the printer up, basically. If the printer just eventually knocks it off of its base, then the print has failed. And that is a thing we want to avoid. Now, this is not a huge problem with PETG, but it is a little bit harder than PLA is. Uh, another downside is it's not quite as good with details, but it's still pretty good. I've seen people print models with it. Now, here's the upsides. The upsides are it's stronger. It's a much stronger material than PLA. It's not brittle in comparison. And the biggest advantage is it has a high temperature resistance. So this can go up to 80, 85 degrees Celsius. You can leave it in a hot car, no problem. It's not really, you don't really have to worry about it warping in any situation aside from maybe putting it in your oven. So PTG is uh, better for mechanical things too because it sustains load better than PLA does. So this was sort of an in-between circumstance and I decided that uh, you know, PETG would be good because I didn't want to give people these bad shoulders in my department and have them leave it in the, their car and have it warp. I just, you know, it wouldn't be cool. So I'm using PETG now uh, uh, you know, for this specific thing. So the Prusa is pretty darn cool. I really, really love this machine. Honestly, I am in love with this machine. My first qualm with it was that it only has a seven inch by seven inch build plate. And I was thinking that's not really that big, but believe it or not, having the Ender 3 right there, just in case I had something bigger, I really haven't. The only time I really use the Ender now, aside from just wanting to uh, print multiple things at the same time, is if I wanna make something as big as I can and see how big it can get. So, you know, beyond that use case, I just use the Prusa Mini for everything. And it is an amazing machine, guys. One thing you may have noticed about it is a lot of the parts for the Prusa Mini are printed in PETG. So yes, that is correct. That means this printer can print itself. Now what you're seeing here is we're doing the first layer of the uh, badge holder. Now what happens later is it will do something called infill, which is something I haven't really spoken of yet. You don't have to really do infill, quote unquote. You can print the entire thing solid, but it takes longer and it's sort of a waste of material because you don't really need something to be that solid, thick plastic. And so what we tend to do is we do a, an infill and we select a percentage. And that's just how, how much infill is there gonna be and how much is gonna be empty space. Now, once the infill is put in, a layer above it for the top will be bridged over the infill. Now what bridging basically means is one thing you might not realize a printer can do is it can go from one uh, structure to another. If it couldn't do that, it, it would have a lot more limitations. 
Now, of course, there are still limitations. So let's say I wanted to print a model of me like this. So that is a problem because my arm would just be hanging out over thin air. And as we talked about, these machines only go from Z0 to Z max. So it would start printing right here and it would just have nothing to rest on. So it can't physically do that. So for that, we need support material, and even my badge holder does need some of that. It basically prints some very thin material that you can later remove with pliers. And it sort of looks like what you're seeing. It will eventually go into what we call interface layers. Now, these interface layers are to sort of help it to connect with what's real, and then eventually it starts printing on top of those. Now, you generally have to remove those with pliers, and I'm just going to show you the final result of what I'm printing, if I can get the camera to focus, you can sort of see there's stuff in there. That's supposed to be the inside of where I put the badge. So I'm going to have to remove that with pliers. You probably can't see what went under the little tabs because it's just too small. I'm going to have to remove all that with pliers. But the end result uh, will be this. And this is kind of where it's more open. Now, I don't know if I can get the camera to focus on this. I think it's sort of trying. But basically, there is some loss in quality there. But it's not too bad. It's just something that you have to keep in mind when you print things, that uh, the issue with the other uh, badge holder, with this one, is that if I printed it without the RSA, I'd be printing it straight up and down with almost nothing at all holding it down on the bottom. So I would almost have to print it up and down like this. Well, the problem there is I have to support the entire underside of it which is a huge loss in quality. And if I'm trying to do something as precise as make a card shaped slit in it, that reduction in quality is gonna mess that up. So that's sort of the type of things that you have to think about when you 3D print things. Unfortunately, it's not just magic, although it kind of felt like it at first. There are limitations to it. And there are things that you may have to either design around or sort of um, just design out. Now, I really love doing this stuff today. It's something that I found can help people, and the printers are just darn cool. And I am so happy I got into it because it's something that I can do where I can do things for other people. It's not just useful to me. I can help other people with this kind of how I feel I do with my YouTube channel. And a hobby to me where you can help others is a lot more valuable to one where you're only helping yourself. I have nothing against video gaming, but when I choose hobbies today, it's stuff like this. It's, um, it's something that I'm really proud, really happy I got into, and I honestly can't wait to figure out what I can design next. Have a good night.